straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Harvey Weinstein loses his bid to drop three sex crime charges against him in Los Angeles, but gains a partial victory. The judge throwing out one and allowing prosecutors to amend the count. Count five is dead. His accusers saying they're ready for trial. She's ready, willing, and able to testify. And a group of black women now suing Johnson & Johnson, accusing the company of marketing its powder products to them, allegedly knowing the powders could cause cancer. Plus, he would like a mistrial. Is that right, Mr. Durst? Yes. The emergency hearing in the Robert Durst trial. The real estate heirs' attorneys asking the judge for a mistrial. He's at risk of sudden death. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Convicted rapist and disgraced movie producer Harvey Weinstein asked the Los Angeles judge to throw out three sexual assault charges. Law and Crime's Angela Levy is here with how Harvey Weinstein won a small victory. Yeah, Brian, Harvey Weinstein's attorneys had to hope to get three counts thrown out, but that didn't happen. Only one of them has been dismissed, and the prosecutor on the case says even that could be short-lived. Harvey Weinstein wants the toast of Tinseltown back in a Los Angeles courtroom in a jail jumpsuit, asking that three sexual assault charges filed against him be thrown out. The charge simply is defective because it's out of statute. Los Angeles County prosecutors argued against dismissing the three counts, both sides citing California cases regarding how much time is allowed for a charge to be filed following an offense. This case deals with the multiple victim allegation. In the end, the judge dismissed one charge from an allegation from 2010, but said it could be refiled if the language was changed. There's simply no factual or legal basis for the charges involving what the people call Jane Doe 3, which is one of the five victims alleged in this 11-count indictment, which is now a 10-count indictment. Count five is dead. The prosecution is prosecuting this case in no small part uh, by prosecution by volume uh, rather than by merit. Meanwhile, Weinstein's accusers are ready to testify. It has not been easy. It's been a tough journey. Uh, it's, the, the long delays are very frustrating, as they are for any victim. Attorney Dave Ring represents one of the Jane Doe's who came forward with a rape allegation in 2017. She knows she's going to testify. She's ready, willing, and able to testify in the criminal case. Deputy District Attorney Paul Thompson told the judge that he would refile that now dismissed charge very soon. We are going to wait and see when and if that happens. Brian. Thanks, Angela. Let's bring in co-host Terry Austin to discuss. Terry, tolling statute limitations and refiling. Can you break that all down for us and why this count was dismissed? Sure, Brian. Every claim has a statute of limitations, which simply means the amount of time that you have to bring a claim. Those statutes can be told, meaning they can be paused by certain actions. And here, it was paused because of the filing of the indictment. So the prosecution filed one indictment, which was timely filed, and then they filed a second indictment on the same claims, and that wasn't timely filed. And what the judge decided here is that it can be repled. This superseding indictment can be repled with more specificity to tie back to the original indictment. So she dismissed this particular count, but she's giving the prosecution an opportunity to replead. And the prosecution has said that it will do exactly that. So this count isn't all the way out. Yeah, but it's interesting to see how the defense was arguing that there are no additional facts to add. The facts are as they presented, both indictments being identical. Let's see how the prosecution comes back from that. Terry, what do you think this could mean for the alleged victims, especially Jane Doe number three? Right. Jane Doe, number three, was the individual who was in count five. And as we heard the defense lawyer saying there, the count is dead. But I think that it obviously must be very difficult to hear that you may not be able to proceed against someone who has allegedly committed sexual assault, as far as you are concerned, knowing that the other counts might survive. But I think there's hope here. I think that Jane Doe, number three, understands and I'm sure that the prosecution is explained that they have an opportunity here to replead and to make sure all the specificity is there to add whatever additional facts may be necessary and to also tie it back to the original indictment. So there's still some hope. And I think that this 
particular victim can hold on to that hope. Yeah, even if she doesn't testify as a victim in the case, there's a potential where she could testify as a prior bad act or uncharged bad act, so she still may get her day in court. And Jeanette, when will, we, when will Weinstein be back in court? He'll be back in court on September 13th uh, for a pretrial hearing. And what was interesting was the judge asked Harvey Weinstein today, or during this hearing, whether or not he would uh, want a speedy trial, want that trial to start within 60 days of that September 13th date. And he says he wants it to begin within 60 days. So uh, a lot of us were waiting and watching to see whether or not he would waive that time period and say, no, they can take longer to prepare, or whether or not he was going to say, no, I want this to begin as soon as possible. All right, so he wants to exercise his right to a speedy trial. Uh, did the judge make any other rulings? Yes, uh, Harvey Weinstein's lawyers, like many lawyers, had asked that he be allowed to wear street clothes during court appearances. The judge denied that request. So as you saw, he appeared in court in a jail jumpsuit. We'll see how that request uh, continues during the trial. You know, oftentimes they're allowed to use street clothes during the trial. It's probably just for these proceedings as we continue. Thank you both. Turning now to more top legal news, a suspect is under arrest after a shooting in a movie theater that left one dead and a well-known TikToker on life support. 20-year-old Joseph Jimenez is facing charges of murder, attempted murder, and robbery with a gun. The Corona Police Department says Jimenez shot two people on Monday. 19-year-old Anthony Barajas is now on life support. Barajas has nearly one million followers on his TikTok account. His friend, 18-year-old Riley Goodrich, was killed. Police say only six tickets were sold for the movie they were watching, and it appears to be an unprovoked attack. And in Wisconsin, the case against a man charged with kidnapping, killing, and dismembering his father is moving forward. Sheriff's officials in Dane County, Wisconsin, say Chandler Halderson reported his parents as missing on July 7th. Investigators reported finding Bart Halderson's torso with a gunshot wound in a wooded area. Law enforcement are still searching for his mother, Krista, searching a pond and landfill for possible remains last week. Chandler Halderson appeared in court Wednesday, waiving his right to a preliminary hearing. The judge bound Halderson's case over for trial. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, will we see Robert Durst take the stand in his own defense at trial? But first, why women are standing together saying a major U.S. company targeted black women for certain products, knowing they could cause cancer. A lawsuit just filed that you need to know about next. Welcome back. A national group of black women are suing Johnson & Johnson, claiming the company marketed its baby powder to black women, knowing the products were not safe. The National Council of Negro Women says many of its members have developed ovarian cancer as a result of using the powder products from Johnson & Johnson. In a lawsuit filed this week, the group alleges that for years, Jane j marketed and sold these talc-based products as safe for consumers and urged their daily use to control sweat and body odor and protect users' skin. Internal documents demonstrate that J&J &J targeted those advertisements to black women, knowing that black women were more likely to use the powder products to use them regularly. These talc products were not safe, however. Johnson & Johnson is reportedly facing thousands of lawsuits over its talcum products. Last year, a judge upheld a court order for the company to pay $2 billion in damages to women who developed ovarian cancer. Civil rights attorney Ben Crump is representing the NCNW. Even in the death of many of our black women who succumb to this ovarian cancer, they are still trying to marginalize them and not make them whole. It harkens back to when black people were counted as three-fifths of a human being, not as a whole person. Where Johnson & Johnson, we declare with this lawsuit that we are going to make you acknowledge black women as whole persons, not three-fifths of a person. Johnson & Johnson said in a statement, the accusations being made against our company are false, and the idea that our company would purposely and systematically target a community with bad intentions is unreasonable and absurd. The lawsuit is being filed in New Jersey Superior Court. The group did not specify how much in damages they are seeking. Back with us is co-host Terry Austin and correspondent Anjanette Levy. Terry, what has Johnson & Johnson said in their defense, and how is a lawsuit showing J&J uh, &J knew the powder caused cancer? Well, they're actually claiming that there were no harmful products like asbestos or talc 
in their products and that those products did not cause the cancer. And so they are also saying that they would not intentionally target a community with any sort of bad or negative intentions. Of course, obviously, they're marketing to people, and if it looks as though purchase it, they might market there, but they're saying they had no bad intentions. The real question, Brian, is what did Johnson & Johnson know and when did they know it? If they knew that these products were dangerous and they were targeting any community, then that's a problem. Absolutely. And Jen, I don't know about you, but growing up, talcum powder was as common as cocoa butter and Vicks in my house. So I'm guessing those ads reach at least one black woman. Uh, but how does one prove that these ads were targeted? You know, uh, I also grew up with Vicks and Johnson & Johnson baby powder. I think we actually have some, uh, you know, in the house here, too. But um, I think that there will be discovery in this case, of course, as there is in every case. And they will also have a careful review of the marketing materials and, and what products were marketed to certain communities. We all know that companies do research. They look to see uh, who they should be marketing to, who they should be marketing certain products to, what demographics. So there may be a lot of material available for the Crump team to examine that could support their case or not. Yeah, absolutely. I think we all know about targeted ads and how those works. You open your phone these days and all of a sudden you were talking with your friend about one item and your phone's uh, advertising into the next moment. So there's plenty of information I think they can dig into. We'll follow up on this case as it continues. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, shocking new allegations in the Robert Durst case. What was said in court that the jury won't know about ahead? We're back. A judge is now considering a mistrial request in the Robert Durst case. The millionaire's attorneys are claiming his failing health will prevent him from testifying in his own defense. Robert Durst's attorneys say he cannot physically testify at trial, and if he attempted to do so, he risks further damage to his health. Durst is on trial for the December 2000 murder of his best friend, Susan Berman. He signaled multiple times in court that he plans to take the stand. Prosecutors have accused Durst of faking his ailments. Before the jury was brought in on Thursday, Durst's doctor testified that the defendant is at risk of sudden death and should be hospitalized immediately. There, there's evidence he may have a tumor in his parathyroid <clears throat> gland, a parathyroid adenoma. He's got the thyroid I mentioned. He has chronic lung disease, both restrictive and obstructive. He's got significant cardiac disease that is a imminent threat to his life at any time. He has esophageal gastric problems that impair his ability to absorb nutrients such that no matter how much you feed him, you will not correct his profound malnutrition. He has kidney disease. He's got a what's called a large staghorn calculus or kidney stone that will never pass. It cannot. It's way too big. It's by definition infected, unlike other kidney stones. So he's walking around now with an infection in his kidney. The doctor went on to say that transporting Durst to court every day combined with the stress of the trial all have ne negative effects on his health. The stresses of coming to court daily, he sits there in a pool of urine and often feces. Um, he's got, I'm sure, a distended bladder. What he needs to have your Honor, is he needs to be hospitalized. And he needs to spend, it would probably take two, three, four weeks in the hospital to get accurate diagnoses and treatment started on his problems, along which he needs to be started on intravenous nutrition, high potency, not just a simple IV. Then he needs to be discharged to a extended care facility where he can continue to receive the treatment for at least about, I would, I'm just gonna guess three months. And maybe he will get better and then he could stand trial. Now, let's just take- All right, let me stop you right there. Um, so bottom line, is he too sick to continue in trial? Yes. Is he too sick to testify? Not only is he too sick, it's dangerous. And is he too sick? to make the decision whether to testify or not. 
he, he's not capable. He's too sick. He cannot make that decision. No. On cross, prosecutor John Lewin asked the doctor if he's noticed that Durst has gotten better during the trial, including sending notes to his attorney and the judge. Are you aware that back in April, Mr. Durst wrote a note to the judge because he was upset about stipulations that were done, and he accused his attorneys of having temporary insanity or collective dementia. Does that sound like somebody who doesn't know what's going on? I, I think you're agreeing with me yes. that he's, he's got cognitive defects. To write such a statement, oh my God, I think you just made my case. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to bet no, doctor, but, but, but we'll, when, we'll you call, when you call your attorneys, I think it's a demented, um, and you write a letter to the judge, which I don't think is appropriate, you think that's normal behavior? You think that's normal cognition? Sir? What it shows is that Mr. Durst is where, readily where engaged in, in his Objective. assessment of this, this case. This, I, 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 I have no further questions, Your Honor. Right? right? I mean, the judgment might be off, but the, but the, uh, the, uh, did you see the letter? I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is uh, quite, uh, the reasoning is good, the logic is good, uh, the, it's, the conclusion's wrong. But, uh, but it, you know, he's thinking, right? I mean, how can somebody, if he's so impaired, uh, pen such, a, uh, such a, a beautiful letter? Interesting back and forth there. When we come back, the judge weighs in on will Robert Durst's murder trial for the death of his best friend continue? Find out after the break. Back now to the murder trial of Robert Durst, where attorneys are arguing whether to proceed. Prosecutors say Durst's medical condition should not stop the court from moving forward. It's a lot of could happen, might happen, could affect him, might affect him. Anybody who's been in this courtroom, and it's amazing to me, that Dr. Klein, who's charging by his own admission $50,000, although when you do the math, it's over $100,000, has not bothered to observe the man in court. Uh, the, the court has had the opportunity. This is a person who's not getting worse. He's getting better. He is fully engaged. He is discussing things with his attorney. He's raising objections. He is engaged in this trial. And then finally, Your Honor, as the court's aware, what they really want is, and, and I, don't, I think the doctor was disingenuous in his last response, completely disingenuous. His comment regarding even just his kidney stone is, it's never going to be operable. It's never going to get any better. So the court, I think, and the court has uh, noticed this previously, what this is is not a request for mistrial. What this really is is a request for Mr. Durst to get a go-home, get-out-of-jail-free card, and never be tried again. And because there is no current acute situation that requires Mr. Durst to be hospitalized, we are talking about chronic conditions, which may or may not get better. And again, Mr. Durst had very serious cancer in 2005. He's still here. He will probably outlive us all. This defendant is unable to testify because of his medical conditions. It's been established, and he is losing his right as a citizen to testify in his own defense. He'll be in a debilitated state, and I will add the following. Unless Mr. Lewin remarkably changes how he cross-examines, cross it will certainly be impossible for Mr. Durst to respond to that kind of cross-examination. We, we briefed it. We provided you what cases we could. We distinguished a villa, at least we tried to. We found other cases that talk about it. We'd ask you, Your Honor, to really seriously consider granting the mistrial in this instance. Thank you. Thank you. I, t I, I take the motion seriously, and thus I will take it under submission. I'll be reviewing these uh, materials that have been submitted. Robert Durst will outlive us all. Interesting statement by the prosecutor. And Jeanette, have you ever heard of a person's health stopping their ability to testify, causing the case to end, and what should the court do? Yeah, I haven't heard of that, Ryan. I mean, we did a story earlier on in this trial about um, looking at this issue, how sick do you have to be to not move forward? And, you know, Robert Durst has said from the very beginning 
that he wanted to take the stand. He said it two or three weeks ago that he was prepared to take the stand. Now that's all changed. So um, I don't know if I've ever seen somebody too sick to take the stand, but I've definitely not seen somebody too ill to go forward with a trial. So I think that he, they say it's not an acute situation. It just doesn't seem like the judge is going to grant this motion for a mistrial, and he hasn't done the, that in the past either. I would agree here. It doesn't seem like the judge is in the position to actually grant that. Terry, judge, the judge did handle this hearing a little different than he did in the rest of the trial. What did you think of that? And should we be reading into how he's handling both sides and kind of calming them down as they argue? Well, I think today Judge Wyndham did put Loom in his place, so to speak. Once during the argument for the mistrial, Lewin actually got up to speak before the defense got up to speak, and it was the defense's motion. So the judge actually had to say, um, let the defense speak, which, of course, Lewin sat down and he let DeGaron speak. But the other time that I think the judge finally did say something to Lewin was when there was a request by the defense to actually instruct the jury that defense was not doing anything wrong just because they questioned a witness. And Judge Lewin actually said, look, I'm going to protect the defense just like I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to instruct the jury that just because the defense talked to a witness or tried to get him to testify does not mean they did anything wrong. So good right. for the judge. Absolutely. Thank you both. And thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.